the final, maybe not final, but it seems like it's the final role play angle to work on is really the most important. You're role playing your own motive. Why did you want to be a Christian? Why do you still want to stay in the spiritual life? What's your own motive? Now the truth is we're going to have a lot of motives. Because we are so programmed with hearsay and mass from kids when we don't know anything, we and it's a you know a blessing and a bane all at the same time, we end up living on a lot of rules. <clears throat> and we were too young to reject or too young to understand or discern. Our parents, whether they meant to or not, imbued us with a lot of values that they had. And those values morphed inside our heads because we didn't necessarily understand those values the way our parents did when our parents were talking. In other words, you and I can have a conversation, but whether you actually understand what I mean by what I say depends on how much of the same mindset you share. Well, when you're talking to a baby, that baby doesn't have a mindset. So the way the baby hears the parent talk, what the baby thinks it means is not at all like what the parent means by what the parent is saying. And that's one big reason why children turn out so differently from their parents is that the baby's getting a whole bunch of input that it doesn't understand and it's going by feeling and it's going to nest you know choose the things that feel good to it and reject the things that feel bad to it so by the time it's five or six and it actually starts to have a vocabulary and the ability to even think rudimentary in a rudimentary fashion it's already been programmed with its own reactions to feelings that it doesn't know if those things are even right. So when you start to say to yourself, okay, why am I Christian? Why do I believe in Christ? Why do I want to keep believing in Christ? What am I in this for? You're going to end up the first things that are going to hit your mind instinctively are going to be like, well, it's right, God is good. Okay, I ought to. Lots of oughts. Lots of rule ideas. I ought to do this. I ought to do that. I ought to honor God. Yada, yada, yada. It's not that those things aren't necessarily true. But God didn't make the choices he made based on odds. He made the choices he made based on wants. In other words, good is good because it's what God wants. Bad is bad because it's what God wants. And Satan's big argument, and you can understand why, is that God is being arbitrary in his wants. God calls X good and Y bad because God wants to. And this whole trial is about whether God's wants are truly better than what Satan wants. That's really what this is. It's about a set of wants that the most powerful person in the universe just flat decreed. <clears throat> Did he make the right choice? Why did he make the choices he made? Are there better choices than the ones God made? God decreed the truth be what it is. Our ideas of what truth is are, are altogether dependent on God's ideas. Because he created it. We wouldn't know what truth would be in some other configuration. God knows all the what-ifs and the, the choices he didn't make. 
We don't know. So he wants us to know. Satan is arguing fundamentally about God being an arbitrary person, making arbitrary choices of good and bad and right and wrong and fulfilling and pleasant and unpleasant. And Satan's out to prove that God's choices are wrong and if Satan will win, then Satan gets to play God instead. And basically, as far as I'm, you know, I'm sort of guessing about how it would turn out. If Satan won, what would happen? Well, God doesn't die. So I guess Satan gets to call the shots and then God would do it. You know, if you got a better idea than that, let me know. But this is a realm of thinking and analysis about the whole question about God and Satan and us. That you don't hear... Um, analyzed much in pulpits it's like they avoid the question they treat it as if it's like even evil to think this way fortunately the movies don't avoid the question very much and you can get a lot of hypothesizing there most of it kind of lame and stupid but not altogether you know when Al Pacino did his little soliloquy in The Devil's Advocate I thought that was pretty helpful Okay. Um, so you have to say to yourself, okay, I mean, really, just honestly, you can choose between God and Satan at any time. Yeah, there are consequences. And you got all this pressure from all the rules that you've heard all your life that are kind of, you know, going to glom on you and make, you know, and sort of try and say, well, you're a bad person if you choose that choice. Forget that if you can. Why do you want? You want. God chose what God chose because God wanted. And one of the things he wants, which shocks me altogether, is he wants us to be as free as he is. Yeah, okay, there are consequences. But what's the point of, I do want to call it, making a choice if it's not what you want. You know, I am free, and so are you, to choose Satan's side. Why don't we do that? What's so shocking to me the most is that God keeps showing me Satan's side of the question. He wants me to understand it. He wants me to be free to choose it. And as it were, to forget about the ramifications. Just look at the intrinsics of the questions. Because that's what he did. You know, he precedes all of us. God precedes us all. He could have chosen what Satan chose. Why didn't he? Nobody has more empathy for Satan than God. So what's the story here? So every single moment, the, the number one battle, as it were, and the number one role play is, okay... This is God's choice. Why is it a better choice? Why do I want God, not Satan? And the the hard part of that is, is that all that, the rules and the habits of, oh, Satan's bad, God's good, yada, yada, hit the brain. And you just sort of have to, like, deflect them and ignore them as if they were background noise and say, no, really, truly, why is God's choice better? Why is God better? And it's not a performance question. It's a how, how, what kind of life do I want as a person question. <clears throat> because as you already know, choosing for God is going to lead to a cross. You're going to die ignominiously and shamefully. Okay? It won't necessarily be, how do you want to call it? It might be quiet, it might be public, it might be long, it might be short. But we're all going to this end of weakness, because that's where he went. And actually it's a sign of failure if you don't go there. 
if you die nice and quietly in your bed and all you had was this idyllic life, then you really didn't grow as a believer. That's a failure testimony, not a success testimony. So it basically is this paradoxical. You have to die like a failure to be a success. You know, when Paul died, he was executed uh, somewhere on the Appian Way by a lictor with an axe. That was the capital punishment for Roman citizens. He talks about it in 2 Timothy 4, 7, and 8. And he was real excited about it. But the actual death itself was totally, you know, he died the death of a criminal. Now, you might not die the death of a criminal. You might be in a hospital bed hooked up to a bunch of IV strips, you know, in a bedpan underneath your butt. And you're like that for months and everybody's saying, oh, poor so-and-so. See how God abandoned him. And they'll resent God if they cared about you and they're resentful of the, the doctor's bills or resentful of having to visit you in the hospital or they're resentful of the fact that you're, you're not conscious. I mean, that's how things go. That's our end. So it really is upfront and personal and primordial in a way. Why go with God's choices? Why be a Christian? Why continue to be a Christian? Why not do what Job's wife said, curse God and die? You're still going to go to heaven. This is where you finally find out about the, as it were, innards of God himself in your own. There are a lot of difficulties there. There are the same difficulties that Satan faces, you've heard me say many times. Christ, of course, went the same course, and he went all the way to the, to the end in God, with God, John 17. God gave him what he wanted. And therefore, we have the legacy of Christ. They have the same spiritual life he had. And of course, that means we're going in the same direction, not the same scope. Not the same degree, but the same kind. So, this is the motive that Christ himself had to grow in. Why did he want to go this way? I mean, he's God. He could have said no. It wouldn't have been a sin to say no. He didn't do anything wrong. If anything, you could argue that it was unfair of Father to put it on him. Of course... Father wouldn't have put it on him. Son wanted it. You could argue that it was unfair of Son to want it because that would make Father have to impute our sins to him. <clears throat> We've gone through the unfairness before and we're going to go through it again in episode 12. But to prepare for episode 12, this final stage of role playing is really important. What do I want? I, me, personal, human. It doesn't matter what the what I look like to the world or even to myself. God put me here. And I am free to reject him if I want. Why don't I do that? And we have to dispense with all of the platitudes that are pandered in Christianity. God is love. God is righteousness. God is truth. God is good. Yeah, of course, but do we even know what those things mean? The answer is no. See, we're living on hearsay. We're living on ideas. We're not. There's no personal knowledge there. <clears throat> if we just keep saying, well, I'm going to do this because God is good. God is right. God is righteous. Do you know what that means? Why does God choose to be good? Why does he choose to be righteous? What's good about it? So that's where you got to do some role playing and exploring. I say role playing because in in order to like live a thing, you got to practice the idea first. 
Okay, that's true with almost anything in life. You know, when you're practicing, when you're learning to, to, to play piano, before you even play it, you got to just move your fingers up and down, but left, left and right on the keyboard to just get used to the movement of the, the fingers. Okay, so role playing is like, okay, what you have to sit down really and do a lot of thinking. What does good mean? What does righteousness mean? And you have to hit it and hit it and hit it and hit it and hit it because for the first 50 times you practice those questions, you're going to be answered in your own head with platitudes that you've been hearing since you were two. And therefore you're living on hearsay and you still don't know anything about what good is, what righteousness is. And like I said in the earlier increments, the idea is to fall in love with righteousness. Well, hi, you're never going to fall in love with something you don't know. And I submit that we really don't know. Christianity has no idea what good is. No idea what righteousness is. It's living on, on you know, labels. And that's the problem with our heads as we grew up, you know, being taught rules and roles and ideas and names. And this is good and this is bad. And so, oh, I'm going to avoid this because this is bad. But I really have no idea what bad is or why it's bad and, and what bad even means. If somebody told you green peas were bad and you were a little kid and you kept on hearing that by the time you were five and ten years old, you would avoid green peas and you'd never have tasted them. And if somebody suggested that you taste them, you'd say no. So you would never know if it were true that good that green peas were bad. And you would never even know how they taste to even decide if they were bad. It's the same thing with all these other things about God. Righteousness, justice, love. What do those things mean? And why would you want them? I mean, love hurts. We kind of all get to figure that out by the time we're 20. Righteousness hurts, justice hurts, truth hurts, pretty much everything hurts. So why do we call them good? It's this final phase of role play, which really should be the first phase also, that grounds you in your relationship with God and enables you to see it through His eyes which was the other role play that I was talking about. But I didn't explain this aspect to it. What is the fundamental character of God, of what he wants, of why he wants it? What does good mean? What does righteousness mean? What does truth mean? What does justice mean? And why are its counters, its opposites, bad? And why do you want one thing over another? So that you have to role play. You have to reason it out over and over like practicing piano until you get past the platitudes. And I don't know how you do that. Do you go for a bike ride? Do you go for a run? Do you check yourself into a hotel room for the weekend? Do you grab, you know, 60,000 sheets of paper and write it out longhand? Do you pound a, a you know, a punching bag? Whatever it takes to get you to practice that thinking and analysis over and over and over and over again so you can get rid of the platitudes. That's what you need to do. And I need to do it too. And you can say, okay, well, bring out what's your motive? And, and I keep coming up with what sounds like a platitude. It's because it's him. I'm in love with him. And I feel really weak when I say that, and ugly and stupid and small, because it's true, but I can't do anything with it. My, you know, okay, so fine, I love, and that doesn't mean I have, there's any integrity to my love. I can't change it, but I can't do anything positive with it. I'm just this whimpering ball of jello over him. 
and where he's gonna he's trying to change that into a backbone for me and it's the way he's doing it is to this kingship thing I have to be motivated the way he is the creator parent motivation which means a certain distance between you and the kids which I can't stand but the parent there's a loss of intimacy between parent and kid even though you can argue there's nothing more intimate than that the kid can't relate to the parent the way the parent can relate to the kid and there's always a distance because the parent's level of understanding and, and appreciation, the kid can't ever share. And that really upsets me. I don't like the difference. I don't like superior versus inferior. Because the sharing gets truncated. But that's something I have to accept. And the other motive I've got is I need to be close to him. Desperately. And this is the only way to get there. Because he's the ultimate parent. That's how it's always going to be. There's always going to be a big gap between his nature and ours. Although we'll be light years higher than we are now. We'll understand him and see him light years better than we do now. You know, once we're dead. Even so, there's a hierarchy of closeness. And you've heard me say that many times, too. And I need to be closer. I just can't. And the only way to get closer is to, you know, um, accept this kingship thingy. It's a whole motive of living toward people. <laughs> And that's where I'm having trouble in spiritual life. Now, why is God good? You know, because I'm, I'm basically failing the thing I'm telling you to do. Why is God good? Well, you've heard me explain it in a sort of like, you know, prof professorial way. If truth isn't free, this is a fundamental why. If truth isn't free, then it really isn't truth. And if truth isn't free, what's the point of there being truth? And if truth isn't free, what's the point of being alive? Okay, but if truth is free, it hurts. All the time. The high and the low are perpetually joined together. That's God's plan. So that the pain and the pleasure are all one. There's no such thing as pleasure without the pain. And there's no such thing as pain without the pleasure. And everything has total meaning. So nothing is meaningless. Logically, that's the only way to live. Logically, that's the only way to design creation. Satan's wrong for that reason alone. To make total meaning out of total meaninglessness. To make total value out of total pain. Then it's worth it. And at the same time now, you know, see, look. God is arbitrary because he is arbitrarily designing that structure. Why is that better than what Satan wants to do? Satan wants to shave the pain. He also wants to shave the knowledge. He wants to make truth not be free. And he wants us to, you know, get all off on our own abilities. So I can sit there and stand on top of the mountain all by myself and say, see, I'm better than everybody else. I don't see how that leads to any kind of happiness whatsoever. That's why Satan's wrong, too. So then he wants a lie. And a not very happy lie to be substituted for God's design. He wants to stand on top of the mountain and say, Hi, I'm better than all of you. And I keep saying it to, you know, the ceiling, as it were. <laughs> Satan, you're wrong. So what if you're higher than everybody else? If everybody's lower than you, what kind of achievement did you have? You didn't achieve anything. Everybody's lower than you, so therefore it's boring to be higher. 
That's why his argument's wrong, too. And God's big argument is the counter. God wants to insert himself into everything that's lower and bring the lower up that way. And, of course, it never is a total equality. But it is a total sharing. And that's the best it can be. If truth is going to be free, then there are going to be differences. And the equality I wanted isn't going to exist. But it's better than nothing, and it's free. That's a real hard lesson for me to accept. It's easy to state, but hard to accept. So that's why I'm voting for God. And it really is just Him. It isn't about being a good girl. I'm not a good girl. That can't happen. Any goodness I got, I got bought for me on the cross. It's a dead deal. <laughs> so now it's just about the relationship. Do I want to be close to Him? Answers yes. Do I want to be parental? Answers no. But that's the way He is. So if I'm going to be close to Him, I'm going to have to go that route. The jury's still out on whether I want to do that. I'm fighting it. Maybe you'll like that. I have a hard time wanting to put up with the brats, namely my fellow Christians, because they love being bratty. Okay, but that's freedom. And I don't like the idea of being king over a bunch of brats forever and ever, even though they won't be brats then. But they will be so much lower. What's to share? And he keeps saying, you have no idea how fulfilling this is. I mean, he's God. He ought to know how fulfilling it is. It's what he chose for his own life. So in that sense, I'm going on not exactly hearsay because I'm hearing it from him. That's why I keep quoting verses like Isaiah 54, 1 and Ephesians 1, 15 through 23 because that's what he's trying to explain to me all the time. <laughs> it's not exactly hearsay because it's coming from the one who's actually living that life. And I do share some of those values, but not enough. So where does all this leave you? I don't know. You have to talk to God about what motivates you and talk to yourself and figure it out. But figure it out. Because the, the winning or the losing of the conflict in your own life, not to mention, you know, the world-shattering impact of your life, which it really is, it starts and ends here. Why do you want to be a Christian? Why do you want to grow? Why do you want to know God? What does good mean? What does bad mean? What does love mean? What does truth mean? What does righteousness mean? Not the platitudes we've heard since we were kids. What are the real meanings of those terms? And why should we want them? Versus what Satan offers. Because if you don't come to grips with the real meanings of both sides, you'll lose. Peace out.